Hello, global community. This is Thursday. These are two chaps, one with a hop mic, one with a muted mic, and many cultures. Welcome back to the Thursday edition. Brett, how are you doing, Mike? Oh, I'm doing fantastic, mate. Thank you very much for giving me that heads up. You put the you put the kibosh on me, mate. We just talked about that beforehand. The, running the technology is not my, you know, I like oh, yes. it. Ah, you, <laughs> you got it down. You got it down, my friend. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how the global business of moving people around is changing. Because well, there's there's this thing going on around the world that makes people a little bit weary of travel. And some countries won't allow people to travel in and outside of their countries. However, there is still movement of ideas, movement of goods, movement of people as well. And there is still such a thing as the global employee mobility world. And we have with us today a guest who's been, they are, say, dabbling in this world for couple of moons. I'm not going to give away how long. I'm going to let him explain how long he's in that world and how this world may have undergone some changes over the last couple of years. So welcome with me from the West Coast of the United States, the one and only Ed Cohen. Welcome to the program, Ed. <laughs> hello, Christian, and hello, Brett. Thank you very much for having me on this program. It's a little after 2.30 here in California. I'm in San Diego, which is, of course, in the far southwest, next up Hawaii from here. But uh, <laughs> still the next up Tijuana. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well we, we want to stay away for a while there. <laughs> but uh, here in downtown San Diego, actually Seaport Village is just across the street here, right on the harbor. Uh, so it's about 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit here. Uh, just about 10 miles south is Tijuana, and just about 10 miles east, it's about 95 degrees mm. uh, simul simultaneously to where I am right now in downtown. So I uh, thank you very much for having me here inside rather than uh, outside. Although if I were outside, I'd be down at the pool. So. <laughs> I will be with you if I were outside in San Diego. Well, since we're comparing, since we're comparing outside circumstances here in Atlanta, Georgia, I hope I'm saying it right. Here in Atlanta, it is the typical muggy heat, and um, we once the temperature goes above 90 in Atlanta, which is basically between March and November, uh, we don't really take a closer look at how high above 90 it is. It's is it. Is the heat like you're drenched in your own sweat by the end of your driveway? Or is it only after you walk for a block? And today is more like by the end of my walkway to the curb where my mailbox is, I'm already drenched in my own sweat. That, that, that's the kind of weather, all right? All right, so how's your electric bill? <laughs> Yeah, I was hoping we couldn't talk about that. That is that, that, that is a uh, terrible conversation to have. It's, yeah, I bet. It's not... I bet. Brett, what, what's it like in Chicago? Cool us down a little bit. Come on. It is. No, it's beautiful here. This is a great day here. This is, but I, I love it. I mean, it gets humid here, but. Uh, you know, I play cricket. Uh, to, speaking of culture, you know, I play cricket uh, here in Chicago. And um, when it gets a day like today, I love it. This is my type of cricket weather. But I play with a bunch of Englishmen. They don't like this stuff. I mean, they need clouds and they need, you know, cucumber sandwiches and stuff like that. I mean, this isn't their weather. But so this this is my kind of weather. This is this is just like home. This is like Sydney. <laughs> okay. And you need to clarify this. You play with Englishmen or against Englishmen? No, with them. Are you amazed to, the, the to humiliate like, them? Or what, what, is that a late revenge you're taking on them? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> No, most of my team are like uh, there's a couple of Aussies. We've got some Englishmen. We've got some. Uh, we've got some Kiwis. We've got some. Uh, we, we, we've got some uh, South Africans when they come and play, and and even a couple of uh, Indian guys. It's great. It's fantastic. We've, we've got a good mix. Yeah. And so I, yeah. I want to make sure that this comment comes in relation to what we said earlier. No, 
Brett is not wearing speedos when he plays cricket. Just to no. get that image out of, <laughs> please get that image out of your head, guys. As tempting as it may be to some of you, let's let's not envision that any any more than necessary. Now I may or may not be wearing them now because you can only see the top half, but I'm not going to say anything beyond that. <laughs> is it that is it going to be that kind of episode? Oh gosh! All right. What Ed, about you, Ed? When you Ed, Ed is the host of a radio show. Is that intentional so you can wear speedos when you're in front of the mic? <laughs> No, no, no. I, I usually dress up in my black shirt. <laughs> oh, and, and, and other things. Before, right. <laughs> like, yeah, right? yeah. Well, welcome. <laughs> welcome, Ed. It's good to, it's good to meet you. I, I, this is the first time I'm meeting Ed, so welcome. And, uh, and I'm meeting, meeting you for the first time. So I'm very interested in what you've got to share with us in the audience. Yeah. Well, Brett, uh, I love Chicago. I, I last produced a meeting there uh, last April, um, and it was on uh, – uh, with KPMG and that tall white tower there, um, uh, I forget the name of the name of the building, but uh, it was that tall, skinny white one uh, on on Randolph, I believe. Uh, Aon building. It's that's the Aon, it the Aon building. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's where we were. Okay. Anyway, this is an opportunity to share ideas and get three blokes, as you say, to uh, get to know each other a little bit better. So. I'm really honored to have this opportunity to, to be on, on your show. And uh, you spoke at a little meeting that I put on in Atlanta a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time we had met, although we yep. have had this kind of dialogue, I mean, email dialogue. Uh, so here we are in the world of uh, video. Well, l let me let me go back in history. When I started in this field, in this industry of cultural training, as it relates to um, employee mobility, that was more than a decade ago, Ed's name had been thrown around in the office all the time. Well, who, who's going to, to Ed's meeting? Or is anyone going to that Ed Cohen meeting? And who, who will attend that? And I was like, who are they talking about? Who is this Ed Cohen guy? Yeah, that, that kind of that great eminence of, of, the, <laughs> uh, of, uh, of the mobility industry. The, the the dark that's scary version. it's pretty scary the, the of 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 relocation management and and then i finally understood what they were talking about so you you you, you it was kind of a throwaway line for you so you put together a little meeting this has been what you've been doing for i don't know how long and you put people together in a room to do what yeah they come together uh from across uh silos and from across industry and from across the street um, and sometimes from across cultures <laughs> and across time zones. I have produced a lot of meetings dating back to 1984. It was my first, very first meeting. It was at the LA Chamber of Commerce in their kitchen, uh, in their building in downtown LA. At that time, I was publishing California-bound relocation guide which is a print magazine eight and a half by 11 and uh, the la chamber was my principal partner in terms of distribution to the corporate community all across southern california uh, so the magazine contained information about uh, the destination in other words it was a recruitment guide mm -hmm. but and i didn't know what relocation really was but uh, i had some idea but didn't know the dimension of it in terms of economic development and the power of uh, having the right people, right place, right time on the part of the corporations. And I didn't know about all the different players. Anyway, I learned quick about that. But uh, though the very first meeting that I put on had Apple and Chevron and Boeing and Ernst & Young and Paramount Pictures so you started with the small mom and pops. Okay, good. Right. So, well, nobody else gave a darn about what I was doing, that's for sure. <laughs> and so you had to go where the money is. You know, the story about robbing banks, you have to go where the money is in order to rob a bank. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> all right, that's a little weird, but uh, that uh, American culture, you know. So, 
<laughs> I, I, I like this metaphor actually because it, it, it's it's not taking yourself too seriously. I like this. No, so no, I don't. when you say you you brought all these players from different industry silos together, mm -hmm. with what purpose? I mean, obviously you you made money in doing so, but what was the outcome? What was the the takeaway for those different silos coming together in your room? So here it was uh, in. Uh, uh, let me go back a little bit in history. It was 1976 in Boston, where I'm from. Uh, I um, met up with a couple of guys who were at that time called personnel managers. Uh, one worked in a high-tech company, uh, actually a, a, re a research and development spinoff from Harvard and MIT, attracting scientists and what was called computer scientists at the time from London, uh, from near Oxford University, as well as from uh, across the US, people who were learning about COBOL and uh, software and computers. And um, they wanted to recruit these people to work at high tech companies around Boston. So the other guy was a personnel manager, a recruiter for a company at the time called Digital Equipment Corporation. And they had invented or, or, and manufactured what's called a desktop computer. In the <laughs> past, uh, used to be a room-sized computer, mm -hmm. uh, I, IBM and Univac and whatever. But um, these guys developed how to uh, reduce the size and increase the power of uh, a computer. All right, so they developed what's called a desktop computer. They've since got, over the years, they got bought out by Compaq and Hewlett Packard. Um, but they were the originators in the commercial space in Boston. And so they wanted to recruit me uh, to work for them uh, as an outside recruiter, and I didn't want to do that. So I said, why don't you partner with me in a magazine guidebook called uh, Recruitment Guide, and we'll take tourist information and combine it in a pretty magazine, glossy color, eight and a half by 11 size, uh, full of information about the different communities where uh, a manager would want to relocate to, a college graduate would want to rent from, and a middle manager with a family might want to settle in in the backyard. Mm -hmm. And so I found advertisers, mostly in Century 21 real estate, to jump on that idea, and they all bought advertising. And I partnered with the Chamber of Commerce in Boston about distribution. And there began uh, what came to be called a professional relocation guide. And I call that one settling in, Greater Boston. Okay. So, so, so you basically invented, well, not invented an industry, but you invented um, a format of information sharing for the relocation industry. You, you invented the destination services guide, so to say. Uh, settling in services. Uh, yeah, I coined mm -hmm. that name. And so uh, that was a long time ago. And uh, uh, a lot of people didn't know what to make of it, but it was a really big hit. And so to make a long story short, I, I sold that business in 1980 and took the idea and moved to LA. Uh, I had already set up contacts through Century 21 and through Worldwide ERC to get introductions to people and businesses in, in LA and uh, had made several trips to LA prior to selling out. Mm -hmm. So um, I did that. And so when I landed, uh, I had a, a book of business basically waiting for me. I just had to deliver. And at, at that time, the mortgage interest rates and uh, were like 18%. There was a recession going on. But President Ronald Reagan was elected. He is from Southern California, of course, L.A., and he promised to destroy the evil empire, okay, and build up the defense industry. And guess what? That was based in Southern California. And so there is the makings of the economic boom that basically was going on until February 28th of this year. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, we'll see what happens next. So... So California-bound relocation guide um, was the uh, 
2.0 version of settling in Boston. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and so, so basically, you used your success model from from Boston and and made made a not a carbon copy but an adjusted carbon copy for for Southern California. Well, Ed went Hollywood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so we also developed with the help of a guy who knew what he was doing with a camera because he worked in Hollywood as a, as a shooter, as, as a photographer. And, uh, um, uh, we said, let's do a video guide to the neighborhoods around where all the, the defense plants are and then sell it to them. And, uh, so we, we did what Google cars are doing you know driving around streets taking pictures of streets <laughs> and and there and there began google maps so we drove around in his convertible in southern california or in the beach communities shooting video of what it's like to see and live in manhattan beach and hermosa beach and redondo beach Palos verdes and of course beverly hills so uh we we did all of that and then we uh brought uh, a rough cut, what's called a rough cut of this 20-minute mm -hmm. video, uh, to my friend and contact, the relocation manager at what was then called Hughes Aircraft Company. Now it's Raytheon. But at that time, they were my largest purchaser of the California Bound Guide. And so this uh, manager of mobility, at that time they called it relocation, manager of relocation says, how much do you want for that? We want to be the exclusive and we don't want you to do it for anybody else. So mm. I gave her, I gave her a price and she bought it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was it. <laughs> was it, was it that quick? Doesn't that usually tend that your price was too low? <laughs> if it was that quick. <laughs> I, I was a jerk. I should have charged more. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, said, you said something interesting, Ed, which I thought was great. And we've had, uh, we've had a couple of points of this theme earlier this week, but you said you had an audience, right? All you had to do was deliver. All you had to do was put it out there. Right. And we've been talking about this earlier this week about shipping the work. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, you I, I know that you've done it before and you were doing it in a new place, but you probably had some second guessing about, OK, is it going to work in a different place? Um, but having that audience, of course, it was waiting. You saw that the audience was waiting. There was a percentage right. of them that really wanted your information. But you still it, I mean, that's great. You could sit you could sit in your armchair and go. Isn't it great? Everybody wants my information, but the important thing is that you got off your backside and did something with it, right? That's the that, that, that's the important thing, which is great. Well, you know what? Uh, I knew how to sell advertising since I was like ten, but um, <laughs> and, and I knew and I knew how to do a song and dance. So it was um, uh, nothing like what it takes to be a business person you know mm. how do you run a how do you run a business how do you manage people mm. and and i flunked and uh, <laughs> you know if, you know you the surfer phrase wipe out <laughs> and yeah. there's a rock, rock and roll song with a high guitar da -da 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 -da, <laughs> you know wipe out and then the guitars play and everyone goes surfing surfing usa okay well wiping out means you go crashing off that board into the water and maybe okay. you, you hit some 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 rocks along the way as well. No, hopefully not. Anyway, <laughs> I, I I wiped out um, mentally and physically, uh, not so much financially back then because things were good. But um, you know, how do you run a business? You know, okay, I could set the product up. There is a market for it. I just had to make it uh, attractive and and present it properly. And it was bought, um, and I and I had no competition for uh, three or four years, and then uh, and then it came. But uh, by that time we were established. But getting back off uh, the bum, okay, you know, after falling down is the key, and you know that is uh, in a, in strange ways it's happening again, not just to me but to a lot of people, and with this COVID thing and how the uh, governments are reacting to it and causing economic uh, ruin for many people. And then, so now what is, what's the next step? The new now, as I call it, you know, that fictional place, the new now mm. over there, take that bridge over troubled waters and 
You're going to go over there to the new now. So how are you going to reinvent yourself? Okay. So going back to 1980, you know, <laughs> and 76 and 80, and then other blips along the way, it's the same thing over and over again. So um, it's not that you get good at it. It's just that if you don't have, first of all, the right attitude, but more so uh, and more pervasive is a product defined, at least in concept, as to how uh, I am going to do it. Uh, and notice my language. I'm not saying how you are going to do it. No, it's personal. Because how are you going to drive it? Mm. Not how the other guy is. You, can, you can't worry about the competition because they are having their own shtick. You know, they're having their own problems. You know, nothing about. And so you just think about yourself and about what you can do based upon the vision that you have for what you want to do, more so what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And and that's really important uh, when you're facing the stress and strain of no money coming in and bills lying around and people getting anxious about you, you're not paying them. And uh, meanwhile, you have people to take care of and mouths to feed. I want to point something out that that was my anecdotal experience with your event, which I think set it apart from other similar events of that nature. You, and you mentioned an organization, WERC. For those of you who are not familiar with what that is, that's the Worldwide Employee Relocation Council. That is uh, an umbrella body of, of people in the relocation management industry. And they, they, they I think they're a well-established entity in the industry. I'm, I'm I don't want to go too deep into this. And when, when they have their, their conferences, they, they used to be a pretty big deal where most relocation management um, people in, in the industry would go to. Now, in my memory, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ed, your events were not in competition with what WERC does or did. Um, I, I felt that you always provided a more intimate setting. And it allowed for people from different silos to connect at a level with each other that was not this uh, not this framework of, oh, we're at a conference or at a trade show, and now we're all here with one objective is to go home with as many new contacts and leads as possible. Um, it, it never struck me as, as an event like that coming to your, to your events. It was more of a, hey, here's an open forum. Here is people exchanging ideas and experiences from their respective corners of, of the work that we all do in a way. Um, and it, it, it was more, I felt it was more of a, a speed networking event with, with people of mutual interest. Would, would that be a fair description? Yeah. Well, you're kind to say that um, this go because you, there's two or three major elements here that you brought up and I'd like to uh, delineate. Uh, first of all, ERC, a um, long time ago, I, my first experience, and I'll be brief, the first ERC experience that I had was in 79. Uh, that was my first one. And uh, I, I really loved it. I found a home, a structure, uh, where it became like a quote-unquote supermarket, you know, walking down the aisles and seeing this product and that product. And it's like going to a, a, one of the national meetings of ERC for me was uh, low hanging fruit. So a lot of the people, the more conservative people at the time, um, they're older, much older than me. And at the time I had a black beard. Of course, now it's fashionable, but back then, boy, and you know, it wasn't, but I had one. <laughs> and so um, they were afraid. And they didn't want any competition. And they made it real clear that if you steal ideas from us or if you uh, copy us or whatever, you know, you're going to have legal action. So I made an arrangement um, with uh, some of the powers that be there. It was going back a long time ago. And I promised to do this and that and da 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 da. And they would promise to not interfere and we would work together and I'd help promote them. So I have to tell you that to this day, as a long time ago, to this day, that relationship continues successfully. 
And I've been um, fortunate, my company is fortunate to have been a media partner in several of the WERC conventions uh, until recently. Uh, so it's, you know, I'm honored, frankly. So what I do, uh, what I have tried to do in those live meetings seems like forever ago, but uh, was to um, elevate and accelerate. So elevate the level of conversation to more senior level. What's the C-suite think? Not the manager of mobility. Although that's important, of course, because it's right on target. But where does it fit into the big picture of workforce strategy, workforce management, having the right people, the right place, right time, right price? It's key to developing talent. Now, back then, there was no such thing as global talent. Nobody knows what that means. And so um, it was just foreigners, you know, international business. Mm -hmm. and, and you do yours, I do mine. So my relationship with ERC was to bring our format of um, comfort and idea exchange in a talk show collaborative environment even way back then uh, uh, to uh, London and Madrid and Paris and Geneva and Zurich and Frankfurt, uh, Milan, Rome, Florence. Um, we uh, have done uh, Panama and uh, Brazil. Uh, we have done Toronto and Vancouver. So uh, all over the U.S. as well. So uh, and Mexico City, as a matter of fact. So. Uh, we will want to continue those live meetings someday, somehow. But in the meanwhile, I've practiced the video idea using mm -hmm. Zoom. Uh, at first, I was very afraid because I was afraid of stuttering <laughs> or, you know, picking my nose or combing my hair or have a dog bark, you know. So yeah, that happens too. <laughs> right, right. So I, I shied away from doing it. Uh, but then one day, it was this past, I'm coming full circle here um, and coming to a close. <laughs> so this past February 13, I produced a meeting in L.A., but not just downtown L.A., where I've done 100 meetings. But this one was at Venice Beach, uh, which is uh, um, now Silicon Valley South, because Silicon Valley uh, for years has had infinite trouble recruiting talent from Southern California to move to the Bay Area. Nobody would do that. Um, and if they did, it would cost a fortune. And for understandable reasons. I mean, so there. they all opened up shop around LAX uh, and uh, the beach cities. Uh, so guess what? We already knew all about that area. So, um, so now all the Silicon Valley has an LA branch, okay? And then you have the startups, of course. So um, we did a meeting February 13 at uh, Hotel Irwin, which is an iconic beach city uh, place. Uh, and uh, we were upstairs overlooking the weightlifting area. It's called Muscle Beach. Um, and uh, <laughs> we had uh, a small group, about 30 people, uh, about <laughs> half corporate. And, and then, <laughs> yes, and then uh, my lunchtime guest was a guy who I knew socially who relocated from uh, UK um, about 15 years ago, and he has become a venture capitalist um, with, in, in companies. Uh, now he's on his own. He's done quite well. So I asked him to come and talk to uh, my audience uh, which was mostly HR people and mobility people, uh, and 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 me. I wanted to know how I could get venture capital to, <laughs> to to. So anyway, he came and spoke, and and he says, "Ed, don't ask me for any money because I'm not going to give it to you." So I said, "How come?" This is in front of everybody during lunch, and so I said, "How come?" And so he says, "Because you're going to lose it." Uh, and then he went into this whole thing, PowerPoint graphs showing like 98% of the people they lend money to, it disappears. 
And he says, I like it. I don't want you to be on my bad list. Okay. But what you have is very, very expandable if you figure out how to leverage it. And you should use Zoom. And you should use LinkedIn TV and, you know, whatever. And you don't have to go anywhere. But you got to figure out how to be Johnny Carson. you got to figure out how to be a good host. And you have to be personable. And you have to use personality. And you have to have really good guests that have been heretofore hard to get at mobility meetings. And he says, you have the contacts. Just go do it. And don't worry about wiping out. Don't worry about failure. Just pick yourself up, start all over again, and go to the next one. And so I did. But I didn't know that three weeks later that would be all that I could do. <laughs> well, but is it fair to say that you, you're you translating the live meetings that were until a couple of months ago? It feels like forever. Um, you're right. translating this into... A, a virtual format into a online TV slash radio type format. And it is, it is the, what did you call it? The, the new next, the new now. Yeah. The new now. Right. Wow. And, <laughs> and I think th this is, this is something that I feel that most of us, no matter what industry vertical we're in, I think this is what a lot of us are learning now and experiencing that, Without growth, without adjustment and adaptation, we die. We will to because we will become obsolete, whether it's because of our competition that is outsmarting and outpacing us or because of other outside influences like a pandemic that will be a major disruption. So it's it it's basically evolution at its finest, right? We we are we are forced into a different direction and those of us who adjust fastest and and most right. elegant and, and most easily will be the ones who i don't want to say prevail but who who first and foremost survive and then forge a new trail right well it's constant reinvention and um so what i've decided to do was to uh i'm giving away all my secrets here Oh. Uh, okay. Are you I, writing I, this down, people? Write this down. <laughs> yeah. Just give us a second. We're going to make notes. It'll be, all be in the show notes, by the way. We're all going to give this away. But uh, <laughs> we're 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 open source people in this uh, in this. Well, little, good, uh, good. You know, and of course, all the millions and you know the the tower of interns that we've got working for us are going to be transcribing this. So, yeah. Fire away, Al. <laughs> no, I'm an open source guy too. I believe in collaboration. But you know what I've learned the hard way, I've learned that it doesn't matter if you share your secrets with your competitors, they still have to perform. And so what I've perfected for myself is muscling ahead. And I mean that with oomph and with ferocity and determination to get that sale, mm -hmm. make that work so when nobody has got any money to spend <laughs> it makes it hard <laughs> and so um you know the, my wife's getting tired of 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 being my financier <laughs> so i mean i gotta find some support pretty quick you know or else we're gonna wipe out so i'm looking to sell more ads okay and to find people who used to spend thousands of dollars to have an exhibit booth at ERC and FEM or whatever. And, uh, you know, what do they take away from that? Of course, everybody loses money on that. They think they're going to win. So for a very small amount, uh, my advertising rates are low. And the reach could be like you, worldwide right. yeah. and nonstop and forever. So this is why I called my show Global TV. And, of course, you can't trademark that, but I did Global TV Talk, <laughs> okay, because <laughs> that wasn't trademarked. So, uh, so that, this is so, how people find you. So um, because if, if people want to tune into the mobility world as, as presented by Ed Cohen, then they would go to where? GlobalTVTalk.com? Well, that's the uh, $64 question, as they call it. Uh, so 
Let me explain that in the current situation, um, Global TV is a business service of globalbusinessnews.net, all right? And that's our landing page. From that, our website has hundreds of pages, including <laughs> Global TV. It also has globalradiotalkshow.com. It also has Global PR Magazine and Newsroom. It also has uh, some other pages, uh, so which I won't bore you with. But the idea is that we have a YouTube channel uh, under uh, Global TV at Cohen, but all of that will become um, very public very soon. So uh, long story short, globalbusinessnews.net will get you everywhere. And uh, and it's uh, right there. Thank you very much in yellow and black. That's great. So so I want to also uh, just ask you, have you have you failed at something? Have you picked yourself up and started all over again? Or has it all been a straight line for you? Well, Brett, that's your question. Yeah, well, uh, there there have been there have been uh, plenty of uh, I've I've been in a couple of different businesses and uh, I've uh, maybe learned from past mistakes that I made earlier on and uh, where I've been able to come up and see the future and see where things are not going the right way and adapt just like you you know um, so it certainly hasn't been a straight line by by no stretch of the imagination uh, I guess I'm very lucky. I've, I find I'm, I'm very privileged to do the work I do in terms of uh, the global mobility space, which speaks to my experience, A, moving countries. Um, I'm also married to somebody who's not from my country. So I'm, you know, I live that every day. So learning, this is a constant learning process. And I've certainly failed at that too, right? I've failed at not reading cultural cues, um, even, even in my marriage, right? And, uh, it's it thank goodness i've got a very patient wife like, like yours <laughs> but i think that these are it's not just business it's like everyday life and it's also about mobility it's about going and being an expat being uh, or or doing business across cultures is understanding you're not going to know everything you know the the great graphic my friend christian puts up is that you know all the i know what i don't know or i don't know what i do know all those kind of things well, we just don't know a lot. And sometimes you've got to be able to fail or, or live into the failure to learn from those mistakes. So I like that because in every kind of uh, pursuit, you're going to fail and, and have to pick yourself up. Yeah. Christian. Well, I'm going to be very short. I failed enough times to recognize which traps to avoid in the future. And sometimes I step in the same trap again, even though I, I, I pledged to myself and vowed to myself that it won't happen again. For instance, I vowed that I will not have a, dark, a barking dog on a live uh, broadcast anymore. And here we go. So um, I think failure is part of the learning process. If, if we don't, if we don't struggle, if, if the line doesn't meander at some point in our development, then there is then there is no new evidence and there is no new new discovery. And then life would be pretty boring. So I'm 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 proud of the failures and, and or the proud of the negative feedback that I've collected because it's I don't want to make it sound so so dramatic, but it's the scars you get that that gives you character. It's it's not the 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 Hollywood nip and tuck uh, illusion of perfection that makes you <laughs> a, a, a character person. It's 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 the the wounds that you that you collect along the way that that make you a, a better person, right? Um, at least that's how I look at it. Yeah. So so what kind of a dog is that? A barking one. <laughs> a, 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 a soon to be a strangled one. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should communicate that the dog and dog is barking worldwide. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you, you know we've got a platform. <laughs> if anybody's re if anybody's listening to the uh, to the audio version of this, I'm going to bring up this question that Antimo puts up, and that's I'm curious if Ed has truly seen passion being rewarded in his career. It's uh, dis it is disheartening to pour yourself into what you love, but you struggle because not many follow passion. So the uh, passion that I've d talked about and um, evidently display here um, is uh, 
sometimes seen as craziness by some people, but at others, uh, you know, others don't see it that way. Others uh, appreciate it. And I'll tell you, the people that do appreciate it right up front are other uh, business owners. Uh, not to say that others don't understand it. It's just that they don't have to deal with it. And uh, they uh, most likely have not lived it where there's so much risk on the line, where you sort of bet the company on your move. And, uh, you know, in effect, you're betting your life <laughs> or the life that you're leading at that moment. So um, business people, particularly customers, particularly people that uh, I've um, sold ad space, in other words, they're underwriting my business, um, they're investing money to get a ROI, they want connections, they want visibility, they want uh, association value with the concept and their competitor is not involved currently or maybe it's part of the contract that I stay away from them. Um, so I'm rewarded for the passion by others who get it. And as Seth, uh, I think that goes back to what Seth Godin says, the smallest viable audience, you know, not everybody's going to want to buy your stuff and that's okay. Right. You know, there, there is always going to be someone there that will, will get what you do, love what you do and be willing to pay money for it. Quite frankly, you know, that the, there is a, you know, to, to buy into that passion, to buy into that, that mission that you put forward. And, um, you know, and we've seen plenty of historical figures that have done that. You know, I was watching the the, the Freddie Mercury uh, movie, the the that that again, right? I mean, yeah, you know, he just went out on his own and did what he did, did his own thing, right? Now, of course, we're not going to be all as successful as that, but there is, you know, that started with a small amount of people who just saw something, and uh, and of course, now the rest of the world has seen it and loves it too, right? We we. Yeah. we easy at getting on board with uh, stuff that's popular, right? Yeah. yeah my, my grandmother, um, rest her soul, um, she always said to me, and as a little kid, I didn't understand. She always said to me, if you're trying to please everybody, you're going to eventually please no one. Mm -hmm. And it, it took me years, probably years after her death, that I recognized what she meant, that it, but by being mediocre and average, you're going to be forgettable. So smallest viable audience, right? The, this is what Seth, Seth Godin talks about is you, you find your tribe, you find the people that share your passion, that, that see your vision and, and you go with that and, and stop trying to please everyone because you're, you're not serving anyone by trying to be average, average is boring. Yeah. So but let you, me also say that you can't do it alone, that you've got to have a, a team um, and not necessarily like a, a football team or a baseball team. Uh, you need to have people that are, are not advertising um, or they're not a buyer of anything, but they are just there for you, just, just, just to talk. And then another team member completely different kind of person who is a buyer and they believe in what you're doing and they say you need to go see this person or that person in other words they intro you further um, and and then the network grows if you're fortunate enough to do that and that my, my, wife, my wife always calls it your network is your net worth. So make, make sure you surround yourself with a network that grows your net worth because sometimes you surround yourself with people that drain it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, uh, I think candidate selection, that's where we come back to, is, is critical, right? So, so I, t I have to tell you that uh, a few months ago I was, at, I was contacted and asked, by a London-based uh, publisher of an economic development magazine um, called, it's called FDI Alliance. FDI stands for Foreign Direct Investment. In other words, companies investing in land um, and for manufacturing or distribution. Um, and so they um, get involved with communities and say, I wanna build a warehouse, I'm gonna employ a thousand people and then they negotiate tax breaks and whatever. So anyway, he puts together a magazine about uh, different cities that are doing that. 
and different companies that are doing that. So he asked me to write an article about my take on relocation of people as it relates to opening up new facilities. Uh, so it, this was back in March, right in the beginning phase, uh, early phase of COVID. And I said, well, what about an article that can give hope to people about uh, what leaders are thinking? Now, I'm not talking about political leaders. I'm talking about people in business. So he said, okay, go for it. So I organized uh, this article by inviting a half a dozen or so people who I knew who had something to say about this kind of topic. And I said, well, give me a paragraph about how you're reinventing or how people should reinvent themselves or how to think about danger and how to think about conquering that fear and or how to build up your staff uh, to be more resilient. And so I got these people to give me a paragraph and I put it together and threw in a couple of pictures and he published it. And um, then he asked me, uh, because it was a success, uh, to come back and do it again and go deeper. So the theme of the next one, just to tie this all together, about perseverance and moving ahead under great stress and unknown. So I'm calling it, um, well, it's not final yet, but I'm calling it um, the new now going into the new now and having a dream of how you want things to be different for you, your product, your company, your family, how you want to live differently, better, whatever, in the new now, you know, and so you have to picture What's the new now? Well, it's that town over that bridge over troubled waters and you get off the bridge and you take a right and then a left and you come to the village of new now and you're going to start over. You're going to have a house. Now, how are you going to paint it? How are you going to make life happen? Okay, what are you going to do? Self-creation, recreation, reinventing. And so that's the theme. And so... He and I tossed that around a little bit. And then I said, well, what about that Martin Luther King speech at Washington Memorial when, you know, there was a, a great time of stress and trouble in the U.S., civil rights? And he says, I have a dream. Someday, blah, 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 you know. And so, but the idea was, I have a dream, and this is what I see, and this is what's going to happen. I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be long, and blah, blah. And so that's the theme of this article. And now that has caught on with some other people that I've requested a paragraph from. So That's nice. I, I, I love this, uh, bringing it back to to the the last big time of distress in this country i mean this country has been in big distress multiple times but i think you rightfully remember the 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 late 60s as as a parallel to some of the things that are happening right now um and and i'm i share this with you so i'm, I'm grateful for you bringing this up that um Yes, the, the new now is is yet to be defined and it may be defined differently for all of us and is it hardship For some of it, us it, it really is. However, we 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 get to we get to define it for ourselves, um, and that that's I see this in, despite all the uncertainty and all the pressure that some of us might be feeling. Um, we're the only species on this planet with with a free will and choice, so we we have the power to to define what the the new now is right so uh, that, that's that's my takeaway for today that we, we while we might feel like we're uh, a ball on the waves of the ocean without control of our environment um yes there are uncertainties but we're still in charge of ourselves so go out there make stuff happen people don't allow stuff to happen to you passively because you're not a victim you're 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 still in control of yourselves that that's at least what what i'm hearing and what i'm channeling through here for us it, it was a pleasure having you today um lo lovely talking to you um godspeed for all your for your digital ventures 
check out people check it out on the website i'm going to bring it up again so if you don't forget where to find it globalbusinessnews.net this is your launch pad for the world of ed cohen and th thank you for being on today thank you guys nice to meet you brett thank you christian let's do it again come on my show global tv we'll do it okay thanks, thanks. Reach ciao. Out. Bye. ciao ciao